Good evening and welcome to our program. The Colorado Foothills World Affairs Pro uh, Council is very pleased to partner with World Denver in presenting managing competition in the Indo-Pacific region. The Colorado Foothills World Affairs Council is a nonprofit organization promoting education and an understanding of international affairs, especially those that impact our daily lives. We have been meeting remotely since last March, but we do look forward to having eventual programs back in person where we've met since 1987 up in Mount Vernon Canyon Club. And thank you for attending this evening. We know you have multiple choices in receiving information, and we are glad that you've chosen this to expand your horizons. Thank you, Deb. I'm John Krieger, and I'm the executive director of World Denver. And we also want to thank you for being here tonight. We are also a nonprofit membership organization that facilitates international exchange and global engagement in the Mile High City. Uh, we especially appreciate the opportunity to join some of our most valued partners at the Foothills World Affairs Council in presenting tonight's event. And before I introduce our moderator, we want to make sure that tonight's program is a conversation. So please join in. You can ask a question by clicking on the question mark icon on your control panel. And please don't wait uh, and ask your questions throughout the program. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the chair of the World Denver Speaker Committee and the former chair of the World Denver Board, Kim Savitt, who's gonna take us through tonight's program. Kim, take it away. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. And thank you to our Foothills uh, colleagues as well. We're delighted that you're all joining us this evening. I'm also really excited to be able to welcome my friend and former colleague uh, in the US government, Lisa Curtis, to speak tonight. Currently a senior fellow and the director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for New American Security. For over 20 years, Lisa has served as a policy and area expert in the US government, including at the NSC, the CIA, the State Department, and on the staff of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where I had the privilege of working with her in the office of Sec uh, Senator Richard Lugar. At the time, Senator Lugar was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then Senator and now President Biden was the ranking minority member. Eventually, as the Senate changed majority, Biden became chair and Lugar the ranking minority member. But we have to acknowledge the other members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at the time were Senators Clinton and then Senator and later President Obama. Lisa's expertise was recognized then and now by both sides of the aisle. Over the past four years, from 2017 to 2021, Lisa served as Deputy Assistant to the President and National Security Council Senior Director for South and Central Asia. She worked under the guidance of three successive national security advisors, General McMaster, John Bolton, and Robert O'Brien. Her focus has been on India-US strategic relations, Quad cooperation, South and Central Asia counterterrorism issues, and one of the hottest topics of today's foreign policy watchers, China's role in the Indo-Pacific region in the world. Lisa is credited with coordinating U.S. policy on South Asia strategy, developing the Indo-Pacific strategic framework, including expanding Quad security cooperation and strengthening U.S. and India defense, diplomatic and trade partnership. Lisa has survived all these positions by being known as a straight shooter. She tells it like it is, and her assessments are based on years of experience and her expertise with the nations of the Indo-Pacific region. While many of you have read her commentary in magazines such as Foreign Policy or maybe seen her on the news, tonight we are just delighted to have her join us virtually for our World Denver Global Issues and Challenges speaker series. I want to encourage you, as John said, to please put your questions in the chat and we will hopefully get to all of them. Today's news is filled with what one of our World Denver members, Dave Evans, calls the most important issue of our times, China, China, China. This is a complicated topic, but help us sort it out. What are the priority issues, Lisa? Why is it that what we all once knew as the Asian region is now called the Indo-Pacific? 
What happened? What changed? Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Kim, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you, uh, Deb and John, as well, for inviting me here tonight and for all of you uh, who have joined this discussion. Uh, it's just a great pleasure to be here with uh, my friend and mentor, uh, Kim Savitt. And it seems like yesterday when we worked together, although it was about 15 years ago uh, that we worked together at the Senate, but it, it is just great to be here with you again. Um, and thank you for that question, uh, because I, th I think it's a valid one. Uh, the term Indo-Pacific actually was coined by the former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And it was while he was giving a speech back in, I think, 2006 in India. And the speech was titled Confluence of the Seas. And he was talking about the connections between the countries in the Indian Ocean region and countries surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. And I think the, the main importance of the term is that you are including India in your uh, conception of what was usually called the Asia Pacific. And I think that's relevant because it acknowledges the important role that India plays throughout Asia um, and more specifically in counterbalancing China. Um, the term was uh, used during the tail end of the Obama administration, and then it was really uh, picked up by the, the Trump administration and continues, of course, uh, to be used by the, the Biden administration. And of course, in 2018, the Pacific Command uh, the, uh, was renamed the Indo-Pacific Command. And at the Department of Defense, the, Asia, the Office of Asia-Pacific Affairs was renamed the Office of Indo-Pacific Affairs. So we, we do see that this terminology is increasingly being used. And my position uh, at the Center for a New American Security uh, was renamed the um, Indo-Pacific Security Program, whereas it had previously been called the Asia-Pacific Security Program. And you know, while we're talking about Indo-Pacific and, and the importance of this region and uh, what it means to be competing with China, um, I did want to point out that the Indo-Pacific Strategic Framework, of which I had a role in developing, uh, was actually released. It was uh, declassified and released to the public on January 15th, shortly before the previous administration left office. And this was a strategy that was, it went through the full National Security Council process uh, where it started uh, to be reviewed by the interagency at my level, at the senior director level, um, and went to the deputies level where you have the deputy national security advisor leading the deputy secretary of state, uh, deputy secretary of defense, and, and the deputies level. Uh, vetting the strategy, then going to the principals level where you have the national security advisor who leads the cabinet in discussing and vetting the strategy. And then, of course, finally approved at the National Security Council meeting, which is led by the president of the United States. So this was approved in February 2018, and it basically drove our policy uh, toward China and what we were doing with our Indo-Pacific partners um, and, and guided us for those three years. And I think that the strategic assumptions in that strategy still hold up. And we know that the current Biden team is in the process of developing their strategy towards China. And in fact, a former colleague of mine at CNAS, Eli Ratner, who was our director of studies, has gone into the administration and is now in charge of the, uh, developing the China strategy at the Department of Defense. Um, wow. So I think that uh, we're going to talk about the, this strategy more in depth, but but the point is that we need to be working with our allies and our partners to really address the challenges that we see coming from China. We're not going to be able to do it alone. We have to nurture those partnerships and work closely uh, with other countries who share our concerns. Well, given that you've kind of started this conversation with China, 
What has China been up to in the Indo-Pacific region and how should we respond? Is the Biden administration already putting together uh, you know, uh, activities on the ground in the area? Uh, well, yes, and and one of the most important things um, that we have seen is the leader level quad meeting. This, the quad is a multilateral grouping of countries, the United States, India, Australia, and Japan. And this was a grouping that was uh, first met in 2007, again, at the um, suggestion of the former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, however, it didn't really take off. And I think this is mainly because China did uh, raise its hackles, objected. So you saw uh, Australia, you saw India sort of back off from the grouping. And it wasn't until 2017 that it was resurrected, resurrected um, by the previous Trump administration. And there were several meetings held at the working level every six months uh, at the assistant secretary level. There were um, two meetings at the foreign minister level, the secretary of state level. Um, but the, the Biden administration held the first ever leaders level meeting, which was quite significant. And they did this within 60 days of taking office. Uh, so that, that was quite remarkable. But stepping back a little bit, uh, let me talk about uh, the challenges that we see from China. And what I would say is in order for the US to maintain primacy in this Indo-Pacific region and to continue to be able to promote a political uh, and economic order, a liberal political and economic order, uh, we are going to have to implement all the tools at our disposal, diplomatic, economic, military, um, and really our, our security, our prosperity, depends on maintaining a free and open area that we have um, access to. This is a, a quite vital region, uh, contains 60% of the global population and 35% of the global GDP. So we, we must maintain access, we must keep the seaways free and open and really insulate uh, countries from coercion by, by other nations, namely China. And we have to assume that China will continue to try to circumvent global norms and rules and try to gain a strategic advantage um, and dominate critical technologies and try to harness them, harness them to push its authoritarian ideology both at home and overseas. So you mentioned the Quad, let's start there. Um, the first meeting with the Quad for the Biden administration uh, went well, it's, uh, it's just starting, but they are working more closely with allies and the partners in the Indo-Pacific region. What should the U.S. do to manage coordination with the Quad? Is there something we should be doing to help uh, more in the organization and setting up standards and kind of ensuring that the Quad is, is used to its best advantage? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think we're seeing the beginning of that organization and coordination. Um, it's been a bit complicated because uh, as I mentioned, China doesn't like the quad and they are not happy when there are quad meetings. And so both uh, India and Australia have been um, careful and cautious, India in particular, um, and not wanting to provoke China. So that, that's been a bit of a challenge in that we see that um, a country like India wants to see the Quad cooperate, wants to see it operationalized and carrying out activities, but they don't want to advertise it. They don't want to be public about what's happening um, in order to uh, not provoke China. Uh, because, of course, India shares a very long disputed border with China. We saw uh, the border clashes uh, last summer in 2020 between the two. So, so India has to keep that in mind. Its geography means that it has to be cognizant of how China is viewing what it's doing. 
but I think the the Biden administration has started this, uh, you know, organizing the group, and the way they have done that is by establishing three working groups. And the three working groups, the first one is focused on vaccine distribution, which is uh, really critical. Uh, we see that there's a great need for vaccines, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. So what the Quad countries have decided to do is the US and Japan will help finance increased production of vaccines in India. Australia will help in the distribution of those vaccines. And they have a very ambitious goal to increase production and distribution um, by 1 billion by the end of 2022. So that was probably the most significant thing that came out of the Quad meeting. Uh, the second was the establishment of a working group dealing with critical and emerging technologies. So the Quad's going to look at how they can cooperate to protect um, access to these critical technologies. Because one thing that uh, the Quad countries and other countries learned was that being over-reliant on China for anything really uh, it puts them in a very vulnerable position. Of course, with COVID, it was the um, protective uh, gear, the PPE, that we saw uh, we were just so reliant on Chinese manufacturers for that. So that has taught a few lessons. And so now the Quad is looking at how you protect, protect critical technologies like semiconductors. You know, how, how do we have alternative supply chains that don't necessarily go through China? Um, and the third working group that they established was looking at how to cooperate on climate change. They haven't really fleshed that out yet, but um, they're likely to focus on technologies, looking at renewable technologies, research and development cooperation, and um, you know how they can look at these issues together uh, to address climate change challenges. So there, there are many issues that the Quad can address. And of course, security is one issue that is important, maritime security in particular, but they did not talk about security issues at this meeting. And I think they wanted to show that the Quad was more focused on providing a positive vision and um, helping the countries in the region with their own economic needs rather than looking like they're an Asian NATO or just focused on uh, security paradigms. So we have received a, a question here from uh, one of our, our uh, World Denver members, Ambassador Catherine Ebert Gray, and she asks, would you be able to speculate on how China would be impacted monetarily and otherwise if the U.S. and Quad reduced its manufacturing dependence on China, reduced its exports to China. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I think the, the idea is not so much to impede free trade or to reduce overall uh, exports to China or reduce overall imports from China. The idea is to protect those critical technologies that might be under threat, you know, that China could use to coerce uh, countries. And that's why I mentioned the, the issue of semiconductors. Um, but at the same time, uh, nobody is talking about uh, cutting China off um, from access to, to these items. But the idea is that, um, you know, we're not dependent on China, that we have other alternatives uh, for some of these critical technologies. The other one is the rare earths, which we see that um, China is able to control the manufacturing, the mine mining uh, of these rare earth materials, some of which are critical to uh, producing batteries, for example. Um, so the idea is that you encourage alternative manufacturing sites, um, work with countries, technologically developed countries like Japan or Taiwan uh, to see, you know, what are the alternative manufacturing sites that we can develop and rely on. So it's really not about cutting off China from the global economy. That's not even possible and, and nobody's 
trying to do that, but it's more about thinking about what are those critical technologies that need some protection that we need to maybe um, take some proactive steps to ensure that China's not able to cut other countries off from those critical minerals or technologies. It's an important issue that I know our members are really concerned about. Um, can you explain a little bit about the Belt and Road Initiative, what it has bought the Chinese? Yeah, I think that's that's a great uh, question. The, the Belt and Road Initiative used to be called the One Belt, One Road Initiative, or OBOR, um, uh, shortly after it was introduced by President Xi in the fall of 2013. Um, and this was during a conference. It was an international conference actually being held in Kazakhstan. Um, and the speech was important because it signified a new focus by China on allowing countries on China's periphery to benefit from Chinese economic growth and success. Um, so it was kind of China, you know, looking outward and and um, uh, you know projecting its economic success so that other countries around it would also benefit. Um, and the heart of the Belt and Road Initiative really has become the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And uh, that represents the largest investment in any country with pledges running at about 60 billion. Um, but it's important to remember that BRI investments are in fact loans, um, but Beijing has never committed to transparent lending. Uh, it doesn't report official lending. And so the risks are that these infrastructure loans, um, the, the risks are often hidden from the recipient. Um, and we saw the detrimental impact of this non-transparent lending in Sri Lanka. And this is in the case of the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. So feasibility studies had showed that it was not commercially viable to invest and develop this port. However, uh, Beijing did so uh, in any case, and they actually poured about 1 billion uh, of loans into the project. But eventually Sri Lanka could not service those loans and the port became collateral for China, forcing Sri Lanka to give Beijing a 99 year lease for controlling the port. So if tensions are to rise in the Indian Ocean region, perhaps between India and China, uh, China now holds this strategic asset that, it, that could serve military purposes. So that I think is the, the concern that some of these loans are being used as collateral for strategic purposes for China. Um, so I think I think that is the real concern, and that is the uh, reason behind uh, the increase in the budget of our International Development Finance Corporation, uh, that was formerly OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. But a couple of years ago, uh, the name was changed. Congress doubled its budget from 30 billion to 60 billion, and now the idea is that. Uh, DFC, as it's called, can provide uh, financing uh, to support U.S.-led projects, or even uh, they, the DFC has new authorities where they can support um, the companies from other countries that are like-minded, uh, other democratic countries, uh, so that countries have an alternative, that they aren't just relying on China. China's infrastructure projects, but they have alternatives. Well, so that, that raises the question of the new development bank, which was established by Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And they've just approved a loan of up to $1 billion uh, to support healthcare workers treating patients for COVID in Russia. Um, it also set up an emergency assistance facility in uh, last year in April uh, to provide up to $10 billion in crisis-related assistance to its member countries. 
And I guess the question really is, is, should the US and the Quad consider the new development bank as a competitor or as a possible partner? Well, it may, may be neither, really. Um, I think that you know Chinese lending through this uh, new development bank that you're talking about, which was established in 2015 uh, for infrastructure projects, particularly in transport and energy, um, in and of itself is not really a problem. Um, it's when the Chinese government affiliated banks like China's Exim Bank or CDB uh, provide loans, like I was talking about before, that are non-transparent and really geared toward uh, strategic facilities um, that people become concerned. Uh, so it's not as if uh, all Chinese lending um, is bad. You know, it's certainly, you know, uh, countries need infrastructure loans and investment they need to be developing their infrastructure so it's we just have to look carefully on terms of the loans what is the project is the project uh commercially viable is it benefiting the populations that it's supposed to um you know is is it transparent so these are the things that we need to be looking at and in fact i'll just mention here that during the previous administration there was a concept developed called the blue dot network which was an idea that you would um, vet or give you know the housekeeping stamp of approval to infrastructure projects so they would be evaluated on their transparency on their inclusivity um, on whether they're developing the, uh, or benefiting the communities that they're uh, purportedly serving. And I think that is a, a concept that can be helpful as we're trying to evaluate these projects and uh, determine what the real purpose is behind them. And so hopefully the Blue Dot Network is a concept that will be you know, further fleshed out and implemented um, by the Biden administration. I think it's one of those uh, concepts that is important and useful. Um, and you know, we'll have to see if it's continued, but, but my hope is uh, that it would be. So it raises a, a number of questions, but um, one is how do you balance US support of free trade and open markets with China's economic dominance and trade competition? But I also received another question in the chat, which I want to add to that, which is, are there real differences in the Biden versus Trump administration approaches as we look particularly at free trade and open markets? Well, I think we've yet to see what the differences uh, are going to be. What we do know is that the Biden administration has kept in place many of the sanctions that were implemented by the previous administration, namely the human rights related sanctions um, on individuals in, uh, involved in you know, uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang province, uh, as well as on companies that are involved in um, you know, employing slave labor uh, in, in this area. So they have uh, kept in place those sanctions. Um, also, they've, they've kept in place the sanctions on the Chinese company, the telecommunications giant Huawei, which is the company uh, that there was a great deal of concern about their aggressive approach to um, implementing 5G uh, the next generation telecommunications um, broadband technology um, throughout uh, the world, really, but in particular Asia, which is where they were really uh, driving this. And the concern is that China actually has laws that uh, mandate that companies like Huawei uh, provide you know, information, intelligence back to the Chinese government. Uh, so there was a great deal of concern about the security of these networks if a, co a company like Huawei was allowed in uh, to the networks. And so the U.S. has raised a campaign um, 
basically explaining these security vulnerabilities uh, that can be introduced uh, by Huawei. And countries have um, been paying attention and they're now weighing whether you know they, they want to take advantage of this cheaper technology. It is cheaper um, because the Chinese government provides so many subsidies to the company. Uh, but they are now weighing the security uh, concerns and vulnerabilities with such technology. So we know that the sanctions that the previous administration put on Huawei, such as uh, making it difficult for them to be able to access semiconductors uh, and uh, any companies that, uh, U.S. companies that, you know, uh, receive Huawei equipment would be sanctioned. So basically making the, the environment um, uh, non-permissive for Huawei to operate. Uh, but, you know, I think those steps were important and clearly the, the Biden administration has not rolled those steps back yet. But in terms of the, the broader trade issues, um, I think we've, we've yet to see, but I, I don't see a lot of differences. Um, I see the Biden administration uh, focusing a lot on, you know, protecting U.S. workers, um, and uh, so I, I don't really see an effort to roll back the, some of the tariffs that were put in place by the Trump administration, but it's still early days. Well, it, it raises another question that is uh, from our chat room. Um, is there any chance of reviving uh, the TPP or some new version of the TPP? Well, I, I say the short answer is not immediately. I don't think we um, see the Biden administration interested in the TTP or its successor, the CP Comprehensive um, Partnership TPP, so CPTPP, I think it's called, um, which Japan, of course, and, and many countries are part of. Um, this does have, of course, a drawback. It is basically taking the U.S. voice um, out of defining the trade rules in the region. And it, it, it means we have less influence, quite frankly. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily a, a good thing from that perspective, from the diplomacy, economic diplomacy perspective. Um, but that said, um, I don't think I, the Biden administration is going to, to jump in to joining uh, these large-scale, you know, multilateral uh, trade agreements. What I think they'll do is focus on narrower um, uh, bilateral trade agreements or maybe, you know, issue-based uh, agreements. They're calling them skinny trade deals. So you, you may see a continuation of that, which is, is what we really saw in the previous administration. So interestingly, I think... Um, the, the trade issues, I don't see a lot of uh, different approaches coming from this administration. So again, um, the question has been, you, you raised a bit about human rights and our human rights concerns. And I guess the question is, how do we weigh and balance our human rights concerns with our economic competition with China? And uh, a lot of our human rights concerns have ended up in sanctions. And so I guess the question really is, is have sanctions failed? Um, do you think they're going to continue? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, we can say that sanctions have failed. Uh, certainly the, the previous administration was very aggressive um, in sanctioning uh, and maybe over relied on sanctioning. Um, my hope is that the Biden administration will certainly have a, a more multifaceted approach uh, to China. And I, I think right now they are developing that approach uh, as we discussed earlier. Um, but that said, I don't think that they have failed. I, I explained uh, why, I th why I think the approach to Huawei was the right approach and, and sanctioning that company. Um, and I think the, on the human rights front, um, we simply couldn't you know, stand by and watch what was hap happening, the cultural genocide really, that uh, has been happening in Xinjiang province. 
And of course, um, Secretary of State Blinken um, announced in his initial testimony um, on Capitol Hill when uh, during his testimony, um, uh, confirmation testimony uh, to become Secretary of State, um, he announced early on that they would be keeping the genocide designation that was made by the previous administration um, towards Sikiang uh, and, and what was happening there, the human rights abuses that were happening there. So uh, I think that um, certainly the, the sanctions, you can't say they have failed overall, but I do hope that there will be a more multifaceted approach toward China uh, as this administration moves forward. I, I would also mention, though, that um, the U.S. isn't the only country that is implementing sanctions against China. The EU just rolled out a series of sanctions against individuals um, uh, involved in the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. So we're not alone in, in using that sanctions tool. India also, uh, after the border clash that I mentioned earlier in 2020, um, this is after China had uh, basically put pressure on India's border. Uh, they uh, deployed troops at five different areas, even deploying into territory that India considered its own. Um, and a clash broke out um, without uh, arms. No, no guns were used. Um, it was basically clubs and, and sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but still uh, 20 Indian soldiers lost their lives and at least four uh, Chinese soldiers. Uh, so it was a very provocative um, action by China. And the way India responded is it, it played its economic card. It banned 200 Chinese apps, which was very harmful for the Chinese companies, uh, uh, big app companies like Tencent, who uh, really saw India as a, a potential great market. But uh, India banned uh, the 200 Chinese applications. And it also uh, decided it would restrict Huawei from being able to participate in 5G trials that would take place later in India. So those were also sanctions. So I think uh, sometimes these sanctions become necessary in order to um, send a signal to China and try to evoke different behavior um, and certainly in light of the aggressive military and political behavior that we saw last summer. And we continue to see when we look at the Taiwan Strait and, and look at the, um, the uh, uh, provocative flights that uh, China has been making and uh, the, the signals that it's been sending there. So yeah, I would say that uh, we need more than sanctions. But I think the sanctions have also been effective. So you, you just touched on one of the other questions that has come into the chat. And it's written as, uh, so can you talk about the 600 pound elephant in the room? No, make that a 6,000 pound elephant in the room, Taiwan. Can you talk a little bit more about what's happening there and responses? Yeah, I, I think the, the situation in Taiwan um, grows more concerning uh, every day, really. And I think what we saw when the Biden administration first um, took power, uh, we saw a very important phone call from Secretary of State Blinken to his Chinese counterpart, in which he made clear that China needed to uh, cease the pressure that it had been putting on Taiwan and that the Biden team would stand behind Taiwan um, and that they would hold China accountable for its actions. They also reiterated the one China policy, which was important, um, but they also were clear on US support for Taiwan's autonomy within that one China policy. Um, but I think you know, we, we need to plan for contingencies. We need to uh, think about um, how we deter China from continuing this provocative behavior. Um, you may have heard that the, the outgoing Indo-Pacific Command commander uh, recently talked about 
the fact that uh, he was concerned that China may try to take over Taiwan within the next six years. So that was quite a statement. And it means that, that we need to think hard about how we deter China. I think we need to be clear about you know, how we would respond, but then we have to be ready to respond. And you know, there are a lot of questions about um, our capabilities. Have we lost focus on this region? Um, are, are we ready for a potential conflict with China? Uh, so the, these are all issues that um, we need to look at closely, and, and people are. Uh, we just had the Chief of Naval Operations uh, provide a public program at CNAS yesterday, as a matter of fact, and he talked about the, the need um, to look at uh, power projection and you know, how we are um, deploying the assets that we have. And it's not necessarily always about the number of ships, but it's, it's how you're employing the assets that you have and having distributed capabilities um, and, and being able to work closely with partners so that if we need access to bases um, in these areas that are very far from the United States, that, that we can. So, you know, working with countries like India, um, Japan, um, and others um, <clears throat> to make sure that we can deploy quickly and and um, have the assets in the area that we need. But yes, this is a a, a very important question, and uh, we need to be focused laser like on being prepared. You know, sending the right signals so that we deter China from doing anything provocative. Um, on the assumption that they don't want conflict either. Um, and then, you know, being able to back that up. Um, but certainly, uh, conflict is not inevitable. And, and we know that the Biden administration wants to focus on trying to find areas of cooperation with China. Um, but the, the issue of Taiwan is definitely a... Um, one of the most important uh, obstacles that we face in the relationship with China and could really um, lead to, uh, you know, lead to bad things, you know, that, that I don't think any of us want to see. And so it's, it's important that we send the, the clear message now. So you, you touched on it. Um, there was apparently a report this week that uh, Chinese hypersonic weapons use American and Taiwanese chips. Um, the question is, has moved not just in terms of our defense and our, uh, our uh, uh, weapon systems and, and ships out there, but the question is, how can we protect our critical technologies? What are the technologies we need to protect, and how should we, uh, how how should the Biden administration really go forward to address these things? Yeah, I, I think that is important. We talked a little bit about uh, technology, but um, you know, the the issue of Taiwan it's it's particularly important um, as we're talking about. Um, but I think the, the broader point is important, too, that China is making this major push to try to dominate digital development in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and this poses challenges ranging from the compromise of uh, critical networks. Uh, I discussed that in the, the 5G context. Um, but it also raises concerns about new technology standards and that China has been placing its officials in some of these key organizations um, that develop standards on technology. And they're doing this in order to favor their own companies uh, while at the same time undermining civil liberties. Um, and I explained how uh, Huawei is, is obligated to assist uh, China in, in the CCP. Uh, with its geopolitical goals, you know, whether that be espionage or sabotage, 
Um, so this is of concern. Um, and, you know, the, the other issue that we have that is very important is that of undersea cables. Um, the amount of information that is being uh, and flowing through these undersea fiber optic cables is, um, is amazing. It's increasing. And given the fundamental nature that undersea cable infrastructure plays in this growing amount of data that is, is flowing through these cables, uh, means that we have to treat these undersea cables as protected critical infrastructure. Um, and we see that China is aggressively pursuing um, building or repairing these undersea cables. Um, and so this means that we, we need to work with other countries, work within uh, multi-nation uh, groupings uh, to make sure that they're not controlling all of the undersea cables um, that are being built. So yeah, this, this idea of, of technology and the need to protect it is pervasive. Um, it's a major problem and it can only be dealt with if we cooperate with like-minded nations and figure out alternatives and, and other solutions and work together to develop standards so that the standards favor um, democracies rather than um, authoritarian or autocratic governments. Well, speaking of democracies, can you talk a little bit about uh, Hong Kong and what the options are? Can you explain a little bit more about what's going on there? Yes, well, the uh, Hong Kong has been, um, uh, you know, it, it's, there's been a problem there for uh, the last couple of years, ever since the national security law came into effect uh, two years ago and the protests started. But China has been cracking down increasingly on these protesters. And unfortunately, uh, the U.S. doesn't seem to have much leverage uh, to, to uh, get China to, to back down. Um, the UK has been resettling dual citizens um, back to the UK, but uh, it's really um, quite depressing uh, to see what's happening um, to the people in Hong Kong. And I think the Biden administration uh, will stand up for Hong Kongers and, and will do what it can. Um, but the question is, is what can you do? Because if you're putting tariffs on exports, you're going to hurt the people of Hong Kong. Um, so it's, it's really um, a conundrum in terms of what the U.S. can do, what leverage we have. Um, basically, I think bringing together the international community to protest China's actions is is kind of one of the few things that we can um, that we can do, and then maybe looking at the longer term is thinking about trying to make a, um, a city like Tokyo uh, a major economic hub. You know, if we're not going to be able to rely on uh, people maintaining their freedom in Hong Kong, um, and the Chinese are going to increasingly put it in their grip, uh, maybe, you know, it won't be that economic hub that it that it has always been, traditionally been. Um, so it, it's a very troubling situation. And unfortunately, I don't see any any easy answers uh, for the U.S. to be able to, to stop China from its crackdown. Well, it, it, it is difficult. And uh, just because I know we're beginning to, to get close to the end, there's an important question that I wanted to make sure we asked, and that's, what do we do about the military coup in Burma? Could the U.S. or the international community do anything to prevent the continuing military attack on civilians? And how should we be approaching this as we manage the competition in the Indo-Pacific region? Yeah, I think the, the coup in Burma is certainly testing the administration's ability to both, you know, stand up for human rights and democracy, 
um, but of course not wanting to cede more strategic ground to China, who uh, has a lot of influence there. Um, and I think you know this challenge of you know standing up for human rights and democracy, but not allowing China a greater foothold in the country, is something that's not going going to go away. And we see it in countries like Sri Lanka, like the Philippines. Uh, and you know it's it's a, a difficult um, challenge uh, that the administration face, but I think the coup of Burma certainly is uh, the most urgent uh, challenge uh, in this respect. And it certainly has been a setback for U.S. policy in Burma. Let's not forget it was the Obama administration that lifted the sanctions in order to encourage democracy uh, coming coming to Burma. Um, you know, six, seven years ago. So I think it's particularly painful that, you know, now with the, the Biden administration, many of the people who work in the Biden administration had been there during the, the um, uh, you know, the hope that democracy was returning to the country. And now to see this coup, um, it's, it's particularly uh, painful, I think. Um, you know, even though I think uh, one could question uh, how much democracy had really taken root over the last six years. And we really saw Aung San Suu Kyi's reputation take a hit after the Rohingya refugee crisis in 2017. Uh, so, you know, there, there were still many questions whether democracy really was uh, functioning as it should be. But even that said, um, the U.S. needs to stand up for democratic politicians, the democracy activists, and you know, despite you know what we could say were the failings of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, there's still this hunger for democracy in Burma. Um, they've had a taste of it. Uh, they they don't want to go back. Um, so the the pressure needs to stay on. We need to work with like-minded governments. Uh, there's been a UN Security Council resolution, even China supported that, which was good. Uh, so the, the pressure is definitely building, um, but it's it's very difficult. Uh, we don't even know, you know, exactly how many people have been killed. Hundreds of people have been killed since the coup started two months ago. Um, and uh, now the uh, just last Friday, the military shut down all broadband access, so the people don't have access to, to news or media. And here I would just raise the, the case of Facebook. Facebook is like the internet for the Burmese. It's um, widely used. Uh, people rely on it for all of their news. It's paid, played a major role in the politics of Burma. But Facebook was criticized um, for the role that the platform played in instigating the Rohingya refugee crisis. Um, the military had actually used Facebook to um, do these uh, hateful postings, uh, portraying the Rohingya, uh, you know, as, as rapists and, and bad people, and really. Um, was responsible for instigating a lot of the violence that took place against the Rohingya. And face, Facebook took a big hit from that. There was a study done uh, a year later uh, by an independent human rights group, which said Facebook uh, could have done better, but they hadn't done enough to prevent that kind of hate speech getting onto their platform. And so now what we see after the coup is that Facebook has really sided with the democracy activists. They have suspended accounts of um, military leaders. Um, and so they, they, they are um, trying to you know, help the democracy activists. But you know, here you are with a situation where the democracy activists are trying to use Facebook to organize and uh, to communicate with each other. Um, and Facebook wants to protect the democracy activists, but it also doesn't want the regime, which is controlled by the military, to shut down Facebook. So it's it's a difficult position that Facebook finds itself in, um, and uh, it, you know it's it's really just a tough situation right now uh, in Burma. And I, but I think the pressure is building on 
the military and if we can just continue to work with like-minded partners in um, keeping that pressure on they're starting to feel the heat economically uh, we're starting to see countries even like south korea which have major economic investments uh, starting to pull out um, so it, you know it's, it's going to be important to um, keep that solidarity uh, with like-minded countries and and keep the sanctions on Wow, um, I'm going to have to say, Lisa, thank you. You've shared an extraordinary amount of information in a very short period of time, although it seemed to me it went very fast. Um, you've walked through one of the most complicated, difficult foreign policy areas of our time. With your expertise, you created a lot of clarity, uh, but boy, this is a complicated area. World Denver is very grateful to you for your time and thank you just for being with us and sharing your time with us i know you're you you think you're uh, you were busy at the nsc and you're busier now so thank you so much for joining us and our our audiences from both denver and and foothills i'm going to turn this back over to john and uh debbie and thank, thank you, you again and lisa and Thanks again for, as Kim said, expertly walking us through so many complex issues in a complex re region and even beyond. And thank you also, Lisa, not only for giving us your insight and your time tonight, but also for the important work that you and your colleagues are doing every day at CNAS to inform and improve the efficacy of our U.S. foreign policy and strategy. Keep in touch, stay tuned, and thanks again. Everyone, please stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you all again soon. Thanks again, Lisa and Kim. Thank you.